Alhamdulillah, verily all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we seek his aid and we ask for his assistance. We ask for his forgiveness and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our souls and the evil of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is no one who is able to mislead him and whoever Allah leads to go astray, there is no one who can guide him. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger and apostle of Allah. I'm about. Today, did you hear last week? No? You? Yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah. We spoke about Ramadan. We're going to speak more about Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Some of the important lessons of Ramadan. Six important lessons. Six reasons why you have Ramadan, why you need to be uh, making the most of this, this period, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. This month is when the Quran it was revealed. As a guidance for mankind. A clear proof for the guidance and the sharia between right and wrong. So whoever of you cites the crescent and the moon of Ramadan, he must fast that month. So one of the first things that you have to understand is that Ramadan is from the five pillars of Islam and it's, we're not just doing it because we want to see what hungry people feel like and this that we're doing it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to so that should be your first explanation if somebody comes to you and says why do you fast the month of Ramadan the main reason is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he told us to he ordered it. My Lord, He wants it from me. And I have to give my Lord what He asks it from me. Inshallah ta'ala. So this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah is the proof for anybody, Muslim or not, that they must fast in this month of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's going to come to you a month. A blessed month. The month of Ramadan. In which Allah has made it wajib, obligatory to fast. And during it, this month, the gates of Jannah are open. And the gates of Jahannam are closed. And all of the shayateen, they are chained up. And in this month, there is a night called Laylatul Qadr, which is better than a thousand months of ibadah. So whoever is deprived of it, it's good. He doesn't get the good of Ramadan. They've truly been deprived. They didn't get any. You really lost out. If you didn't get the benefits and the barakah and the Laylatul Qadr, you lost out because. This only comes once every year. And it doesn't guarantee... Hey, leave the door. Leave it open. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to see another one. So you have to try and get that. It's like a bonus. 1,000 month bonus. Anytime you catch that month, that day, that night, you're going to get 1,000 months worth of Ibadah for everything you do. It's times 1,000 months. But from the many important lessons to be learned from fasting is the first one is that we have to gain taqwa it's what it's all about this is where it all comes down to gaining taqwa because <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said oh you who believe fasting is prescribed for you it's been ordered for you to do as it's been prescribed and ordered for those who came before you so that you might get taqwa this is sort of the so one of the salaf Talak ibn Habib he said when fitna appears then extinguish it with taqwa when hardship comes to you Deal with it with taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So the people, they, they said, what's tawakkas? What's tawakkas? What is taqwa? What is it? This, how am I going to distinguish it with taqwa? What's this taqwa? And so he replied, Taqwa is to act in obedience and in accordance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon the iman from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to have hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And taqwa is leaving acts of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the light of Allah due to the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they've said that this is one of the best definitions of taqwa. Because I'm sure if I ask anyone here, what's taqwa, you're not going to be able to explain it properly. You're not going to be able to break it down. You, don't, you know what it is, but don't know how to say it, or don't know how to explain it, or don't know what it means. So, it's the main thing that you're supposed to be getting out of Ramadan, this taqwa. So you should know what it means. You should know what it is. And just say again briefly, you to act in accordance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing what Allah wants from you. And hoping to get the mercy of Allah. Hoping that the things you do are going to get you into Jannah. And having and leaving the things that Allah is displeased with out of the fear of Allah. Being afraid that if you do the things that Allah doesn't want you to do, you're going to go to Jahannam. So it's a balance of having hope in jan- for Jannah and fear of the punishment. That is taqwa. And there's no action that will be considered to be worship or obedience or, near- or nearness to Allah unless it starts with pure Iman. In this pure Iman, thus it is pure Iman. Sir. And it's not from habits or desires or seeking praise or fame. That's not how you do worship. It has to be based upon pure faith. And the goal of it, every action that you do, should be to earn the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make Him happy, to make Him pleased with you. And so fasting is a means of getting taqwa. That's why we're fasting in Ramadan. It's a means of getting this taqwa, which Allah will be pleased with you for, which you will get rewarded for. Yeah? And you'll save yourself from doing what Allah didn't want you to do, which is not fast, and to avoid the month of Ramadan, and to do haram things in Ramadan, which will lead you to go to Jahannam. So it's an opportunity to save yourself. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, said Fasting is a shield which prevents the servant which the servant uses to protect himself from Jahannam, from the fire. Fasting becomes your shield from the fire of Jahannam. So the Muslim should ask himself every day of the fasting has this fasting made you more fearful and more obedient to Allah? Has it helped you in distancing yourself from the sins that you used to do and the disobedience? You have to check, is this working? Am I getting what I'm supposed to be getting out of Ramadan? Am I doing this properly? If not, then you're going to just be wasting your time going hungry for nothing. second reason or the second benefit of Ramadan is to see nearness to to who? to who? to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sir. not nearness to your blanket in bed not nearness to you know how your man your mom your dad none of that nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the purpose, the benefit of, of Ramadan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 
whoever shows enmity to a friend of mine, I shall be at war with him. Allah SWT is saying, whoever tries to diss one of my friends, I'll be at war with that person. And Allah SWT has said, <coughs> My servant does not draw near to me, My servant does not draw near to me with anything more beloved to me than obligatory duties that are placed upon him. There's no way to get closer to Allah, no better way to get closer to Allah rather than doing the things that Allah asks you to do naturally. Doing the ibadah, doing fasting in Ramadan, getting up in the night time. Doing the things that Allah SWT asks you to do is the only and the best way of getting near to Allah. Sir? And everybody wants to be close to Allah, to be on His good books, in His favor, that He'll forgive you for all of the things He's done, that He'll accept you, that He'll put you in Jannah with your friends and your family and the people who made it and the pious people and the prophets. If you're not near to Allah, then you're not near to Jannah. And then Allah SWT said, and then my servant, he continues to get closer to me by doing all of the, the, the nawafil, the sunnah deeds, so that I shall love him. Allah SWT loving you, because you started to do extra sunnah. You started to use miswak. You started to go in the masjid with the right foot, make the dua when you went in the masjid, make the dua when you went in the hammam, when you put on your clothes, when you took off your clothes, when you, before you went to sleep. These little, little things, the extra things you did, made Allah's love for you increase, intensify, and brought you nearer to Him. And that's why you should try to do those extra things that you know everyone else isn't really doing. You go that little bit further saying, I know I'm doing this little bit extra because I'm a soldier of Allah. I love Allah and I want Allah to be happy with me. I don't know about anyone else. I don't care about you guys. All I know is that for myself, I'm going to do this extra two rakah after dhuhr because, or extra four rakah after dhuhr because I want to get that little bit nearer to Allah than my next friend. I want to get a little bit nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I'm going to make the dua before I eat Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalamu wa or I'm going to you know smile with my family with my companions and my friends I'm going to do that little bit extra because I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love me for it <coughs> and so drawing closer to Allah the most perfect as the wajal in this, in this month of Ramadan can be achieved by fulfilling the obligatory things that we're supposed to be doing. Also by reciting the Quran and thinking about it, reflecting about its meanings. What is the ayat saying? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? It's not just a book like a newspaper. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to you. So when you open it, you're looking at the words of the one who created the heavens and the earth created human beings from dust talking to you it's the words of the one who created this whole world so it's worth thinking about what is he saying what does he want from you what is he asking you to do what is he telling you about what is he warning you about it's not CNN news it's not Al Jazeera this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so when you read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should think carefully about everything that has been said to you. Because it will either be for you or against you on Yom al Qiyamah. The Quran can be for you or against you. It can be against you in a way that you read it and you didn't even do what you read. You didn't even do what Allah told you to do and you read it. It can be against you because you didn't read it and it can be against you because you read it and you didn't do what you're supposed to be doing. So it's not just a book to you know, brush through like a comic. It's something to consider and ponder upon. Also, you can draw nearer to Allah by increasing in kindness and giving charity. See, it's easy. These things are not hard. But the reward is great. You can also make dua 
Supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that hard? It's not hard. It's not hard to say, Oh Allah, forgive me for this. Oh Allah, I would like to have this. Oh Allah, save me from this. Oh Allah, give my parents this. Oh Allah, give me this. Oh Allah, give me that. It's not hard. You can also attend the Taraweeh. It's weird. The Taraweeh Salah is, a, is Sunnah. High Sunnah. Highly regarded Sunnah. Highly recommended. But it's not wajib. If you miss it, you didn't do haram. But you find all the people, they come to the Taraweeh, but they didn't come to Dohr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. Why did they just come to Taraweeh? I'm not saying don't come, but I'm saying have things in perspective. Do the obligatory things and then add the sunnahs after. So you find that the masjid is full of people you've never seen in your life. And you probably won't see them again after Ramadan. Allahu alam. And they're doing the sunnah as if it's wajib. And they're leaving the wajib as if it's sunnah. Subhanallah. Also, you can seek out and look for and try to find Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. <coughs> the night which is better than a thousand months. The night that if you catch it and you're doing Taraweeh, or you're doing some Ibadah, or you're doing some Sunnah, or you're doing anything forevermore, you're going to get a thousand months of doing that thing as if you were just doing it for a thousand months consistently not even stopping to sleep or eat that is a bargain that only happens once a year you have to catch it if you didn't catch it it's like doing Hajj without getting Arafah Yom al Arafah it's like you missed out the, the fruit the biggest, the best of the fruit of Ramadan you missed it so when it comes to the last ten days you get your ibadah on. You don't know which night it's going to come. You don't know when it's going to fall. You just get your ibadah on. Go for it. The last ten. The last straight. The last. You can see the flag at the end. You can see Eid just down the, you know, not far. You go hard and you get it in. Because you want to catch that night of power. Inshallah ta'ala. At the same time, you have some kahotis and waste guys that they come just for that night. They never come to the mosque, they never pray usually, they never come to the Jama'ah, they never came to Taraweeh. They came on one night that they thought was Laylatul to Qadr. And thinking that, yeah, I'm going to get a thousand monks and then I'll come back next year and do the same. This religion isn't a game. It's not a joke. You can't try and trick Allah and fool around with the religion like that. It's pathetic. Pathetic how much people try to do this. But we're not like that. Inshallah. We're the ones who do our ibadah throughout the year and we're looking for this night to top ourselves up, get that boost up. That one that will help us get miles ahead of those who are sleeping on that night. And they'll never be able to catch you. The difference between you and someone who gets later to Qadr is a thousand months of ibadah. How's he going to catch you until next Ramadan? So you, you leap shot yourself ahead. <coughs> Another way to get nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to come to things like this. The attendance of gatherings of knowledge. Gatherings where you're going to learn something about your religion. Where you're going to improve yourself in your deen. Where you're going to remember something that you can take home and teach someone else. Where you're going to find something that you can actually implement in your life that's going to help you. Something that's actually going to help you. I'm not here teaching you maths and science and geography. I'm teaching you something that if you do it, you're going to be the one who benefits on Yom Al-Qiyamah. I'm not saying geography is not worth studying or there's no benefits in it. But after you die, what good is geography? Nothing. No, it doesn't benefit you at all. <coughs> Unlike <coughs> the gatherings of knowledge where you take on one little piece of something and you implement it. And it can save you from Jahannam. And it can raise you in your places in Jannah. And you could be up on a station which you never thought you'd ever get to. Just from implementing one small thing that you benefit from a circle of knowledge. So in that month you should increase in trying to attend these activities.
<coughs> and strive in the actions that will cause your heart to draw close to Allah and to gain His forgiveness. That's what we need. We need the tawbah. We need it. How much flopping have we done all year? How much missing about? How much sins? We need this tawbah. We can't let this month leave us without getting all of our sins forgiven. Not just one or two. All of them. This is the time to wash yourself in the fountain of Ramadan. You have to get it. Or you're going to be stuck with them. And if you die with them, you're going to be in a serious predicament. So therefore, your striving should be more in this month than any other time. There's no other time that you should be fully on this thing except Ramadan. There's no other time that you should be going all out to please Allah except for this month of Ramadan. Sir? Sir? And that's based upon the excellent reward that Allah has put in it. Alhamdulillah. And likewise, one of the benefit, one of the best of the ways is to do itikaf. Who knows what itikaf is? Put your hand up. Go, go, go. One hand? Kind of. Anyone? You got one. Anyone else? Khair. Okay, tayyib. Itikaf is to seclude yourself in the masjid. That's it. Mobile phone off. No Game Boy, no PSP, none of that. You go in the mosque and you sign yourself off from everyone. You're there with your Quran or your book or whatever you're studying. And you just, it's just you and Allah. You forget about cars and noise and traffic and shops and sweets and the dunya. You forget about all of that. Wives and kids and everything. Forget it. This time is just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is itikaf. You go into the mosque, you sign off. You sign off from the dunya. Ibn Qayyim al jawziya rahimullah, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made itikaf for the people. The object of it being that the heart becomes fully occupied, preoccupied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Your heart concentrates only on Allah. You forget everything. You forget about everything else. You forget even how much money you got in your pocket even. You don't think about nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cut your, yourself off from the dunya, the creation. And the heart will only be engrossed, like it will, it will flourish with, with uh, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll start to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll start to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. And you'll turn to Him. And your turn to Him takes the place of all of your worries. You're worrying about exams, you're worrying about bills, you're worrying about marriage, you're worrying about clothes and this and that and money. You're worried about all of those things. But not when you're in itikaf. You just sign off from all of that. Forget it. As if you're not even going to come out of the mosque. As if you're going to die in the mosque. Forget it. Whoever, whatever. It's, it's not even, you're not interested at that time. And your heart becomes filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it takes away these worries. You, start, you stop stressing about it completely. And then you're more able to overcome it. When you have to deal with it. Thus all these concerns, all your thinking is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All your thoughts are directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Him and thinking of Him and how to get His pleasure, how to make Him happy. Different magnificent techniques. What am I going to do to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy? What, am I, what, what extra thing can I do right now? It's Ramadan. Let me not waste this time. Let me do something extra with it. And this leads that person to feel content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of content with people. You're content with Allah. He's enough for you. You don't worry about gang, crew, clique, wife, kids, bank manager, whoever. You're not worried about anyone else. You know you've got Allah and that's more than enough for you. <coughs> and this prepares you to be at peace and alone with Allah. So that on the day when you're in your grave and you've got no one, no one to turn to, your mom's not going to come and comfort you and hug you and say you, it's going to be okay. 
You're completely on your own. And you've got no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will prepare you for that time. The itikaf will prepare you for that time. And Ibn Qayyim said that that is one of the greater benefits of itikaf. The third important benefit from Ramadan is to acquire sabr. We know what sabr is. Alright, good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Alright, everyone knows. What is it? Huh? You know if we end up, I'll say, what is it? Patience. Masha Allah. It's patience. Acquiring patience is one of the best blessed benefits of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. I'm going to tell you why. Remember Ahmed said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned patience, sabr. How many times do you think it's mentioned in the Quran? The word patience and having sabr. Have a guess. Give me a guess. How many times do you think patience is mentioned? Whoever gets it right, look at this chocolate right here. Go on. 200. Seven. Five. Sixty-five. Fifty. Fifty. Seventy. Seventy. A lot. A lot. Hundred fifty. Sixty. Eighty. Three hundred. One hundred. One hundred. Seventy. Seventy. Eighty. Eighty. Fifteen. Fifteen. Twenty. It's mentioned ninety times. Ninety times. So who said eighty? Someone said and someone said a hundred. Uh, you guys got to share this between yourselves, yeah. Wait till after the lesson. Sabr so. has been mentioned over ninety times in the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Not just for the fun of it. It's been mentioned for a reason, because you're meant to have it. You're meant to understand it. You're meant to know it and implement it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The month of patience has." And this Prophet Sam said, the month of patience and the three days of every month are times for fasting. Ibn Abdul Bar Rahimullah said, What is meant by the month of patience is the month of Ramadan. So fasting is called patience because it restrains your soul from eating, drinking, relationships, sexual desires. The Prophet وسلم, said, Oh you young people. Whoever from amongst you can get married, then do it. Get married. For it restrains your eyes and it protects your private parts. But whoever cannot get married, then let him fast. Because it will be a shield for him. So fasting is a mean of restraining and having patience. With patience, you're able to resolve and strengthen your ibadah with sincerity and to cope with life's ups and downs. It comes from sabr. Well, I swear to you, it's so true as well. When you start doing things having patience, you find life it's that easy. You're not in a bank. Ah, oh, this queue so long. Brrr. You find it easy. You go to an umrah. You find people getting mad, throwing away their ibadah, hajj, people getting angry, screaming at each other. But if you just have patience, do your tawaf, whatever people are knocking you about, but just have patience man, you're getting it bad, you're doing this for Allah, just keep calm. You're in the queue, the KFC queue, I had one guy in Mecca, F, 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 because he's hungry. Like what kind of, have sabr man, that patience makes your life easy, believe me. So it helps you to deal with, 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 with your life. For example, with the patience, you're able to perform your prayers properly and correctly without being in a rush and just pecking on the floor. Some quick sajood. With that patience, you're able to 
restrain your, your souls from being greedy and stingy so that you can give sadaqah and zakat. <coughs> With patience you're able to subdue your temper. If you've got bad temper or you get angry quickly using your, your sabr, you're able to overcome that. You're able to endure the hardships of hajj. It's hard. You get angry. But you just keep calm and you'll get through it. Without losing tempers or behaving badly. Likewise, the patience will help you stand firm when it's time to be standing and fighting the jihad against the kuffar and the munafiq. We're standing them from their onslaught because they'll be coming at you, coming at you and you're going to have to have patience. Without becoming hasty or impatient or becoming scared and running away at the first signs of difficulty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, O Prophet, urge your believers to fight. So that they, if, so if there are a hundred who are patient, they'll take over, they can take two hundred people. And if there's a thousand who are patient, they'll overcome two thousand people by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is with the ones who are patient. Inna Allah ma'asabareen. Allah is with the ones who have patience. That's Surah Al-Anfal. So without knowledge and patience, then you don't have anything except for excitement, zeal. That's all you have left. If you haven't got knowledge and patience, you just have excited. Oh, let's do this, let's do that. Let's do that. You don't have knowledge of how to do it. You don't have patience how to, 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 to overcome the hardship of it. And it becomes uncontrolled emotions and just shouting and hollow slogans and speech that doesn't even make the people get stronger and firmer. But a speech that makes people get weaker and more demoralized. And it doesn't build but rather it destroys. So in this month you have to strive to develop a firm resolve in doing your acts of obedience and to adorn yourself, dress yourselves with the clothing of patience and having certainty in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorry in, in the saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said and know that victory comes with patience relief with affliction and ease with hardship these things come together victory comes with patience Relief comes with affliction and ease comes with hardship. Another one of the benefits of your Ramadan, your blessed Ramadan, our blessed month of Ibadah, the best of all months that could ever grace this earth, is to cultivate good manners. You should be benefiting and cultivating your akhlaq, your adab, your behavior. You should. You should be really checking it and making sure والسلام, that changes have taken place in you. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, Whosoever does not abandon falsehood in their speech, lying, and in their actions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for him to leave off his food and his drink. Meaning, if you're not going to close your mouth and stop chatting nonsense and stop talking crap and stop backbiting and swearing and slandering and talking ill-mannered then Allah doesn't need you fasting for Him. He doesn't need you to be going hungry and, and, and giving up your food and drink. And at the same time, you're chatting people behind their back. You're swearing, you're cussing, you're lying, you're joking, you're rapping, you're dissing. What's the, Allah says He doesn't need you to be fasting, giving up your food and drink if you're still going to carry on with ill speech and he sallallahu alayhi wasallam, also said fasting is not just about leaving off food and drink but rather it's more also about staying away from ignorant and indecent speech so much so that if anyone abuses you, cusses you, swears at you, disses you 
and behaves ignorantly towards you then you just say to them I'm fasting, I'm fasting if someone comes to you and starts dissing your mom or whatever or trying to get you to be angry or trying to get you out of your frame of mind and your peace of comfort and your tranquility don't argue back don't defend and start getting uh, aggravated just say I'm fasting I'm fasting if you want I'm fasting after Ramadan <laughs> you know what time is the point is don't engage that person don't give up your ibadah don't give up your good deeds because someone tried to draw you out just maintain and tell that person listen I'm fasting you know I'm fasting bro don't not right now not today it's not that type of time it's not it's not the time for this and you stay away and you bat and you you you, you abandon the, the the falsehood of speech and getting drawn into uh, being aggravated and argumentation and swearing and cursing and whatnot save yourself forget anyone else B- to be honest with you save yourselves and your family everyone else is not your responsibility Although you should try to help everyone else, you should save yourself first. That's the point. So this narration it points towards the, the importance of being honest and truthful in your speech and your manners. <coughs> this is a blessed month. It's not just teaching us how to abstain from food and drink, but also how to uh, uh, abstain from statements and actions which cause harm and violate other people's rights. Since the Prophet Sallallahu said whilst he was describing a true believer anyone in here a true believer? Yeah I should hope so. Inshallah. Say Inshallah. We're all true believers. Well this is what the Prophet Sallallahu said is a true believer. <coughs> A Muslim is the one who the other Muslims are safe from his tongue and safe from his hand. That means you're not going to be harming other people with your speech if you're a true believer. You're not going to be cussing people and assaulting, insulting people and offending people and have dirty mouth if you're a true believer. I don't mean dirty from cakes and biscuits. You're there in speech and language. Therefore, it's upon every, it's upon us individuals to examine our shortcomings and our character. Everybody knows in your character there's something missing from what's making it bang on, right? Right? Everybody knows there's something missing that you can make you a better person. So it's for you to know what is the thing missing from you. And try to fix it, try to find it, try to correct it. In Ramadan, this is the time. Know yourself. Have you heard that saying before? Know yourself. Salam. You should know yourself and know what you're lacking in. Know where your weakness is. Know where you're falling short. And fix that. So that next year, inshallah, or after Ramadan, from then on, you are one less fault away than you were before. You fix something about yourself. You change something about yourself. You've identified something and you've made amendments to improve yourself. Well, wow. excellent. Therefore, you should be trying to match yourself to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with the best of examples. So you check yourself by his example. All of us falling short. How can I get closer to being like the Prophet Wasallam? That's what you should be asking yourself in Ramadan. How can I get closer to being like him? That is the ultimate objective. Inshallah. Expert. And it was he who mentioned, I guarantee a house on the outside parts of Jannah 
for anyone who leaves arguing. Just leave arguing. Don't get into arguments. If you leave arguing, I guarantee you, you're going to get a house on the outskirts of Jannah. And that's not going to be your only house. If you get to Jannah, you're going to get cribs, right? But you're going to get this special one that's been mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ. Just because you left off argumentation. So much that you leave it, that even when you're right, even when you're right, you don't. You just leave it. Oh yeah, I know I'm in the right. I know this person's wrong. I know this person's oppressing me right now. But you, forget it. I'm not even going to get into it. I can't be bothered to argue. I don't want to be arguing with you. I, I'm trying to get my house in Jannah, inshallah. Allow it. Allow it. Go argue with yourself. I'm not going to argue with you. Over it. If you can do that, the Prophet Sallallahu guaranteed you a house in Jannah, inshallah. And the Prophet... And a house in the center of Jannah now. That one was on the outside. This one, bang in the center. If you want to get that house, it's for whoever abandons lying and falsehood even when they're joking. No, a joke might be funny if you lie, but you still lied. So, leaving off lying so much that even when you're joking you don't even make a joke about someone which isn't true the Prophet never used to joke with, with lies he used to always joke with the truth always used to joke with the truth for instance an old woman she came to the Prophet she's very old she said Ya Rasulullah is there going to be any old people in Jannah? The Prophet he looked at her and he said No, there's not So she turned away Quite sad Quite depressed, wondering what's going to happen to her As she was walking away, he called her back He said, hey, that's because everyone's going to be 33 years old in Jannah So there won't be no old people And she got happy, she started to smile to that. So the Prophet says, he joked with the truth. Never lies. So the one who wants the house in the center of Jannah, they will joke only with the truth and they'll leave off all false speech, all falsehood. Be afraid to lie. Think about it in your head like, am I going to say something that ain't true right now? I've, got, I've been asked the question, how can I answer it? Honestly. Even if I don't want that person to know something or whatever, I have to answer it honestly. Like someone's, you, you know, they're, trying, they're meant to be coming to meet you. And then you're like, where are you? Like, yeah, I'm outside. He's outside. He don't want to tell me that he's just left his house, that he's nowhere near me. But outside's outside. I might think he's outside my house, but he's not. He said I'm outside. The point I'm trying to be, the point I'm trying to make is, <coughs> don't lie. Sorry. Don't do it to yourself. Next time. That's not lying, is it? That's being using your words well, avoiding the lie. Avoid having to do that. And then the Prophet Sallallahu He offered one person a house on the outskirts of Jannah. For what? What was that for? The one who? The one who didn't argue, right. He offered someone, he guaranteed someone a house in the center of Jannah. That was for who? The one who doesn't lie. Even when? Even when he's joking. And then he said, and then I'll guarantee a house in the uppermost part. Of the center of his part. Salam Of Jannah. For he who makes his character good. He who tries to better himself. And make his character better. That's a deal man. That's a deal. So there's no better time to try and achieve that. Than Ramadan. Kick it in. Fix your character. You know there's something wrong. You know that you're not perfect. None of us are. But fix one little thing. Make it like the Prophet Get a bit closer to his example. 
and that might be the one thing that gives you the highest house in Jannah inshallah the fifth and final important thing that we can achieve from Ramadan Oh yeah, one more hadith to add in regards to the last point Which is a good benefit for you guys here So by leaving off oppression, shamelessness Harboring hate towards Muslims, backbiting, slandering, carrying tales, he said, she said, and other types of uh, barter and lying and false speech, you save yourself from nullifying the reward of your fasting. That? You save your fast. You didn't just go hungry and thirsty for nothing. Because the one who doesn't leave off these things, they just went hungry and thirsty for nothing, man. That's all you got out of Ramadan. Hungry stomach and dry tongue. You didn't get the reward because you didn't leave off the false speech. And you didn't pre prepare and perfect and improve your character. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He said, It may be, it may be that a person fasting. He doesn't get nothing. He doesn't get nothing except hunger and thirst. It's possible that someone in here is not going to get nothing from Ramadan except for being hungry and thirsty. No ajr, no reward, no forgiveness of your sins, no getting closer to Allah, no improvement of your character. You got nothing except for you just wasted your own time and you just went hungry. And you were thirsty and you came out empty handed. Shame on that person. <coughs> so the fifth and final benefit that we can well there's many, but from these five that we mentioned in today, is sensing, you get a sense of the Muslim unity. You get there in Ramadan. Aki, come here man, I like that smile man. Come sit with me over here, Aki man, mashallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Fast when they fast Break your fast When they break their fast And sacrifice the day that they sacrifice. Imam at tirmidhi the Muhaddif Rahimullah said, some of the people of knowledge explain this hadith to mean, to say, by saying, it's meaning is to fast and break fast along with the Jama'ah. Walik salam. And the majority of the people. So you don't just go break your fast on a, on a bus with a biscuit. But you come to the mosque and you break your fast with the brothers. And you get it in, we've all been hungry together, we've all been striving together, we've all been going without together. And now we're all going to break our fast together. And it brings love and harmony. That doesn't mean that you go around hopping to all of the, the Asian masjids because you know that they give beer baris and beer curry. Doesn't mean that you go and do that. You don't go around mosque hopping for the best breast iftar. But you do it in the Jama'ah. You go to a mosque and you get your fast broken with your community, with the community of Muslims. It brings and increases brotherhood. Sir? That's why in this uh, month of Barakah, you can sense the feeling of unity. You can, you can get that, that vibe that I feel, I feel tight with my Aki right now. I feel tight with this community. I feel tight as a Muslim. I feel tight with my brothers. All of us fasting, rolling, riding, whatever, doing what we're doing. We're all going through this together. Why? 
fi sabilillah for the sake of Allah for the reward from Allah to improve, improve our taqwa to get all our sins forgiven all your sins forgiven subhanallah you guys don't even realize what a benefit that is how many sins are you holding wheelbarrows of sins to get all your sins forgiven to get the month of power thousand a thousand months of ibadah <laughs> only a waste man would miss that <coughs> only a waste man would miss, miss the last 10 days of Ramadan in the masjid getting it in seriously and like I said anyone who does get it in he's a thousand months better in worship than someone else who didn't get it in and that person will never be able to catch him unless he lives longer than him don't waste it And so, also, you get a feel and a sense of awareness of the state of affairs of the Muslims and the hardships that they're going through. Because during the fast, the Muslim feels and experiences what the needy and hungry people are going through. That he, for instance, our brothers and sisters in Somalia right now, it's not easy out there. It's not easy. They don't have food. They're not fasting out of a choice. They don't have a choice. They're fasting because they have to. Because they have nothing to eat. And because even if you want it, even if you got money, where you live there's nothing. There's no rain, there's no meat, there's no there's no crops. Money can't even help you. And you're starving and going without. And then when it comes time for iftar, you got nothing to eat for iftar. You can't even break your fast. So you have to travel to another town where they might have a little water or they might have a little crops or vegetation or some meat or, meat or food. And on your journey there, your kids are dying one by one. A woman with seven kids leaves to get to another town. She gets there with two. It will give you a sense of reality what is going on around the world. Don't think, oh, because you're a London Achi that everybody's living it nice and large like you. No, they're not. A lot of people are suffering. What you get in a week is more than a quarter of the world people they get. Not all together. Understand the point. What you might get in a week, your EMA, your job seekers allowance, your, your pocket money from Hoyer, whatever it is, your work, your wages, you're well better off than some people in some parts of the world. For a whole year they don't see that. For a whole year they don't see 40 pounds. For a whole year they don't see a hundred pounds. And you're getting it in for free, you're just asking for it. You just kill your hair. Because you're in this place, you're getting it. And they're going without. So that fasting that you do, it's going to remind you, listen, it's not a joke. People are starving, people are dying. And you're thinking about, yeah, what should I have for iftar? KFC or MACD's? Or, or Boris and Basto? What should I get? What should I have? You're already walking around with your moose, your banana in your pocket. Looking forward to where you're going to break your fast. They don't have that out there. Your people don't have that. Our brothers and sisters, some of them don't have that. So it's going to remind you what they're going through. It's going to give you a sense of... Nah, i got a responsibility to my people, to my brothers, to my sisters, to the Muslims in general. So that going through that experience will force, you know, where those people are forced to go without it. And we're doing it because it's our ibadah. And to be honest, only because it's wajib people doing it anyway. If you, if you, you see that the sunnah fast people don't even do. The sunnah fast no one ain't doing. So we're only doing this month because we have to. And then they're doing it because they don't have a choice. So it will bring you that to your mind. And make you remember your people that are suffering. Or our people. And it will help you to remind yourself to send aid and support to those people who are going without. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And all of us 
All of you, hold together fast. Hold, hold fast all together. Two, two up. To the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't be divided. <coughs> all of us cling together to this rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shahada. This taqwa. This all we got. This iman. Hold on to it, all of us. And don't be divided. Don't split up. Don't go into groups and clans and cliques and squads and mobs. Unite. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the believers, men and women, are friends and protectors to one another. You're not a believer if you're not there for your people. If you're not there for your ukti or your akhi. You're not a believer. Don't gas yourself if you're not there for somebody who's going without. And then your brother, your Muslim brother and sister, especially in Ramadan. Later, you can't even help your akhi in Ramadan. That's sad. And then you want to call yourself a believer because you've got front row. Nah, you're not. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, The welfare of the people will not be complete, neither in this world or in the hereafter, until, except with the, 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 the collectiveness, the, the unity. <coughs> the the ishtima and the ta'awun, the, 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 the cooperation mutually with each other. And the tanassur, the, the uh, mutual, the helping of each other. And the cooperation in order to secure each other's uh, benefits and to, uh, to ward off harm from one another. Don't just think about yourself. I know I did say yes, save yourself. That's because Allah said that. Save yourselves and your family from the fire of Jehennam, whose fuel is men in stone. Save yourself, yeah. But saving others is saving yourself too. Helping those who are going without is helping yourself too. It's a part of being a Muslim. And actually for me, it's one of the best parts of being a Muslim. The brotherhood, the unity, the collectiveness.